Hi everyone and welcome to Conspectus. I'm Dr. Keshav Malhotra. I'm the director of Meta and also the director of Rainbow IVF. And today we are going to be talking about UCI factors, how they can actually affect our embryo selection process. So whenever an embryologist basically tries to create an UCI, these are the parameters that we look for. So it should be normal in size. So when I talk about size, it should be about 110 to 120 microns in diameter. It should be roughly spherical in shape should have a clear to moderately granular cytoplasm, should have a small perivit line space and intact polar body within that perivit line space, which is less than 5% of the total cell volume, should have a colorless clear zona pellucida. Again, this should not be thicker. Uh, and when I talk about thickness, it should not be more than 22 microns. Normally, a zona pellucida is about 17 microns in thickness. And Lastly, the cytoplasm should be devoid of any inclusion bodies like the fractal bodies, like the vacuoles, like SVRs, etc. Now we know from uh, literature that a natural leg is somewhat different from a stimulated leg. Obviously, the logic behind this is that the ovary is programmed to produce only one egg at a time, and once you're forcing the ovary to produce multiple eggs, the quality does get compromised a bit. And that is why it's very important that we grade these oocytes to select the best kind of embryo. This grading process starts right from the cumulus oocyte complex itself. So a normal cumulus oocyte complex would look something like this, where you have the oocyte itself. So let me let me just focus on the cursor. So you have the uh, the the oocyte itself, which is surrounded by a layer of corona cells, and then you have a sunburst appearance of the uh, cumulus complex cells. So that is how a normal COC would look like. An immature COC would look something like this where the cumulus and the corona are tightly compact or tightly adhered to each other and such an egg most likely you're going to get an immature egg from such a cumulus suicide complex. This is a post mature COC if you notice the corona here is tightly adhered to the zona pellucida. It's very very dark in color and the cumulus cells also will be in actually clusters. So you'll have clusters of cumulus cells which are also quite dark in appearance. So that's a post-mature COC. It mainly happens because of, of a premature attenuated LH uh, release during the stimulation process or because of a delayed HCG administration. This is an atretic or a degenerating COC. Almost 3% of the total eggs that you receive on an average would look something like this and these eggs obviously have to be discounted. So let's start with grading the egg, egg itself. So when I start the grading process, I usually start from outside. So I'll start from the zona pellucida. So like I mentioned, it should be clear and colorless and it should not be thick. So it should not be more than 22 microns. So if you notice the thickness here in picture A, it's almost double of picture B. Right. So this is a thick zona pellucida. This is a normal zona pellucida. This is the thin zona pellucida. Obviously, there are other aberrations which also happen, but the main thing that we need to know, focus on uh, at this point is that it should not be on the thicker side because this can compromise the hatching process, can compromise the natural insemination process as well. Now, a perivetaline space should be small. So, what, what I mean by small is that one third of the ulema should be in contact with the inner membrane of the zona pellucida and two thirds of the ulema should be free. So that is how a normal perivit line space would look like. <clears throat> now, the only problem that you can actually observe when you have a large perivit line space, which is something like this, is that when you're doing ICSI and when you're poking the egg with the injection needle, there's a high probability that the egg moves around and you can damage the egg if you're not careful. So that's something that you have to note. Some other times what you can see is that the perivit line space would have something like this where you can actually see a lot of extracellular fragments so you can actually see debris within the perivit line space. Now this also is not the best kind of sign and has been correlated to HMG stimulations in some of the papers which are available online. Now the polar body is one of the only parameters which can be graded. So grade 1 polar body is basically a round or an oval polar body with a smooth surface. Grade 2 is round or oval with a rough surface, grade 3 is a fragmented polar body and grade 4 is a large polar body. Now apart from a large polar body, all the other three, the results are very variable. But with a large polar body, the chances of having an aneuploidy are much higher. So that's why when you have a large polar body, that egg should usually be avoided. 
the other three you can still follow it up and the best kind of embryo that you get out of those eggs try and select that for transplant cytoplasmic maturity is also very very important so a normal maturity or a normal mature cytoplasm will look something like this so you can actually see that this is moderately granular just look at where i'm moving the cursor so this is the kind of cytoplasm that you would want to see within the oocyte now whenever there is an aggregation which looks something like this where you would you can actually see the pointed cursor right here this actually signifies that the cytoplasm has not achieved maturity but the nuclear maturity has been achieved because of the presence of the polypoid so in such cases if you don't uh, have a conception from these eggs maybe in the next stimulation cycle try and extend it from uh, maybe if it was a 9 day stimulation to a 10 day stimulation so maybe adding that one day of extra gonadotropins can actually help you in uh, getting the eggs to achieve cytoplasmic maturity obviously when you have such a diffuse granularity or a diffuse granular congregation within the, within the cytoplasm is not the best kind of sign and it would not give you the best kind of outcomes Inclusion bodies are also very very important to uh, notice here. So now there are three kinds of inclusion bodies that we have to worry about vacuoles, SCRs and refractile bodies. Now vacuoles if it's one or two or if it's like a small vacuole uh, no need to worry about it too much but if there are multiple vacuoles like you see in picture number B obviously such an egg is not going to give you the best outcome. SCRs look something like this they are a flat disc like structure obviously if you compare a vacuole to an SCR you can see the difference a vacuole has more depth that's why you see the shadow inside an SCR has more depth it's a flat structure so once you change the focus of the microscope it's going to vanish now these SCRs have been associated with a lower implantation rate and a higher miscarriage rate so that's why again deprioritize based on these features Again, similarly with uh, refractile bodies, they are associated with a lower implantation rate and a higher miscarriage rate. So deprioritize your embryos based on these uh, oocyte factors. One more thing that I like to actually visualize or would like to actually see when, when I'm selecting the embryo as far as the egg factors are concerned is how the oocyte behave during ICSI. Now, it's very important to actually look for the cytoplasmic viscosity because that's also a sign of cytoplasmic maturity so if the egg cytoplasm is a little viscous it gives you that initial good resistance while you're actually injecting the uh, oocyte um, so like you are actually seeing when you aspirate the cytoplasm if it's giving you initial resistance uh, that actually tells us that it's a good cytoplasm it's a mature cytoplasm and those are the eggs that i would prioritize for embryo selection um, as far as the egg factors are concerned so that's also something that i really prefer when i'm selecting the embryos now obviously whatever i've mentioned here is uh, mentioned in this paper by laura Rienzi and her group and uh, it's a wonderful paper based and it actually gives you a lot of insight into side morphology uh, as far as human IPF is concerned so i would like all of you to go through that and also if you have the time go through this atlas of human embryology by ishray and look at all the different um, kinds of eggs that you can actually achieve from stimulation cycles look at all the uh, dysmorphisms which are there and it's a great learning tool which actually has developed for clinicians as well as embryologists so I, these are these are the things that i would like to like you to go through obviously uh, you can enroll for the webinar series that we are producing with meta and we're going to be talking about oocyte quality in detail this is just a short capsule of it so uh, if you're interested in that do uh, watch this space and we're going to be coming up with a link very very soon so that's pretty much about uh, oocyte factors as far as embryo selection is concerned and if you have any questions do shoot them to me at metaembryology at gmail.com and i'll be very very happy to answer them and uh, do go through the other lectures as well uh, they'll give you brief insights into different different topics and uh, based on that you can actually choose which, which kind of course or which kind of uh, webinar that you would like to attend so thank you so much and hope you have a good day